Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Zing and I'm the founder and host of Empathy Gaps, a non-YouTube video podcast. Welcome to episode 11. Ever try to navigate a website and it is just extremely hard to use? From the way that the website might not be designed for mobile users or serve the specific population it is targeting, websites should be designed with the intent of being easy to use, accessible, and convenient. In this episode, Melissa and I will discuss how trauma-informed design can shape societal attitudes towards depression and anxiety, how trauma-informed design changed the outcome of a project, and how trauma-informed design can be implemented outside of website design. Here is my conversation with her. Hi everyone and welcome to Empathy Gaps, an online video podcast focused on creating a safe space to discuss mental health and psychology while also working to address the needs of the current mental health crisis. I'm Tiffany Zeng, your host, and today we have a very special guest, Melissa Eggleston. Melissa is the founder of Bird Call UX, a consultancy offering research, design, and training services worldwide. Additionally, she is focused on incorporating trauma-informed design into technology. Melissa, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time to join me. Before we start, is there anything else that you want to add regarding to what you do or who you are? Well, I appreciate you having me here today, Tiffany. It's nice to be here with you. Um, I also teach uh, user experience research and design at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm a student myself. So I am getting my doctorate in uh, design uh, focused on trauma. So we're trying to sort out how do we make these designs better for people who have been through trauma. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. And so my first question to kind of establish some background, like what does trauma-informed technology mean for those who don't know? Yes, that is a good question. So trauma-informed technology is a new idea in general. So if you have never heard of it before, that is totally okay. It is a pretty new concept. But it's the idea of taking the six principles of a trauma-informed approach and applying it to either the tech design process and the technology itself. So trauma-informed is about how we do our tech work. And the principles I use come from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency in the United States, and it's called SAMHSA for short. So when I say SAMHSA, that is what I'm talking about. And they were developed, these principles were developed with experts um, on trauma, people with lived experience of trauma, behavioral health researchers, and the public. And it was developed for the United States. So these are the principles I use. They make a lot of sense for people who are working in the United States to use. If you are in a different um, geography with different culture, there may need to be adjustments or different principles that come into play. But there are six main ones, one being safety, both physical and emotional, second being trustworthiness and transparency, third, peer support, four, collaboration and mutuality, five, empowerment, voice and choice, and then six, cultural, historical and gender issues. I think I got them all. Yes, I think so. And so it's about thinking about how do I make my research safer, both for me and for my research participant? And how do I make sure my app design is trustworthy and transparent? You know, do I explain what I'm doing with the data when I get it? Do I explain why they need to give me the data to begin with? Um, There's just a lot of things we can do in tech that's a little bit different. And these trauma-informed principles give us a way to do tech that's more ethical. Um, And that's more thinking of the the humans that are using the technology, I think. Mm -hmm. And then what are some like things or features that make technology trauma informed? Yeah, that's a fair question. So when when you're having using these guiding principles, for example, then you can start to think of like, well, how might that manifest on a website, for example? We might see websites for people who are in tricky interpersonal violence situations. We might see something like a quick exit button where if somebody clicks on that quick exit button, um, uh, the weather will pop up or Google or some kind of neutral site because maybe this, this person is in a dangerous situation and they can't be showing anybody else that they're looking at this information to get help or, or change their situation. So that'd be an example of like safety, a safety feature on a website. Um, And there's still continuing research. We're trying to figure out like how valuable are these types of buttons or not. Um, And then there's other things like just reducing cognitive load, um, which is a way, of course, to help people access things, make sure they can read it without a problem on mobile as well as on desktop. And that is very much like about empowerment, right? About giving people options. People can don't have to go to a laptop. Maybe they don't have a laptop. Maybe they only have a mobile device. So that's another example of like, where you'd be doing something that is also good design, but it's also trauma-informed. Mm-hmm. And then 
I guess, like, what kind of inspired you to work on trauma-informed design and technology? Yeah, so I had this friend, and she was an educator who was helping medical staff become more trauma-informed. And so she was talking to them about how to be more trauma-informed during childbirth. And I was friends with her, and I'd never heard of this word before. This was like 2014. I was like, what, what does this mean? And that's when she sent me to um, SAMHSA's website, and I looked at some of their documents to kind of learn what, what does trauma-informed even mean? And so then I started thinking about how does this apply to my work? And just thinking about if somebody has been through a traumatic experience, and traumatic experiences range wildly, and we can talk more about that, but the idea that they might then reach out for help through a website or an app or some other kind of system and get blocked or feel crappy or feel excluded or feel trapped or feel like this isn't for me, like that just makes me feel sick. Uh, I, I think we need to be able to help everybody, right? And even well-intentioned ideas, for example, a low-income program uh, to help people pay for internet connection or something like that, sometimes can only be accessed through a laptop. You can't really use the website, even sign up for the program on mobile. And like, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're not really thinking about the people we're serving very well. So um, while we are getting better as a whole, uh, I just want to make sure that anybody who reaches out for help online can get the help they need. Mm -hmm, of course. And then I wanted to kind of pivot to, I guess, like how these trauma-informed design principles can influence like attitudes, I guess. So how can trauma-informed design principles influence like societal attitudes towards like mental health and trauma and help kind of like reduce the skyrocketing numbers of depression and anxiety among the youth? Yes. Yeah, so the more we all understand trauma, the more likely we can be supportive of other people and also more empathetic with ourselves, right? So trauma is often very misunderstood. Um, often when you say the word, people think of like tornadoes and terrible childhoods and just like these really dramatic things. And while those are typically, yes, traumatic experiences, trauma is very individualized. Um, it comes in a lot of different forms. It comes in repetitive things that happen. For example, persons experiencing racism, for example, that's trauma too. Um, so there's things we don't even think about around exclusion that can be quite harmful. So the way um, SAMHSA has defined uh, trauma has been, it's either an event or a circumstance that results in either physical harm, emotional harm, and or life-threatening harm. And the the... The thing that makes it trauma, not just like, wow, that was stressful, is that it has a lasting negative effect on either mental health or physical health or emotional well-being or social well-being or that sort of thing. And when you look at it like that, when you have like a broad definition of trauma, you realize we're all going to have trauma at some point in our life. It is not it is not something that we're going to be able to avoid. It is like the rain. There are times when you get wet. <laughs> it is just part of life. Um, we may lose somebody close to us. We may experience racism. We may be in a natural disaster. There's tons of things that happen. COVID was a huge trauma that affected so many people in a negative way, right? And the more we understand it and the different uh, symptoms and impacts of trauma, the better we can do in designing things like social media, right? Which youth use a lot. And we know that. And there are people who are trying to apply trauma-informed principles to things like social media. So for example, um, I have a colleague, uh, Dr. Carol Scott, and she's a trauma expert. And she wrote a paper about how could social media be trauma-informed? And it's super relevant. We can put that in the show notes for other people who might be interested in that. Um, Oprah even, uh, not that long ago, uh, wrote a book uh, with a trauma expert called What Happened to You? And so the more we all kind of can understand and be more trauma-aware, I think we're going to do a better job of designing things that are better for, for youth as well as other groups, and also being more empathetic with each other because we're going to have a better perspective. Mm -hmm. I also think like maybe just talking about trauma-informed design principles and um, letting other people know about it and talking more about how we can help people with trauma in various ways can also like lessen stigma and make us more open to talking about mental health and mental health related to trauma. So I'm glad that there are things like, as you said, social media that's trying to be pushed towards like to be more trauma informed. Yes. I mean, we need to talk about it. It is this context that we cannot avoid. And if we if we try to ignore it, it, it backfires because it's it's part of being human. Um, 
I've heard different social workers say, you know, where there's humans, there's trauma. And it's just kind of part of what, what it means to be human and, and the kind of the world we live in that, that can be violent at times and it can be scary at times. And with climate change, all kinds of weather things are happening more and more. And, and there's lot, there's lots of different reasons why we might have experiences that are, that have lasting harmful effects for us. Um, but it's sometimes hard when people oftentimes, when you say the word trauma, they think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. But if you ask them, well, have you experienced this or this or this? They'll go, oh yeah, that happened to me. And you're like, okay, that's trauma. Um, mm -hmm. So it's this kind of, um, you know, response that that many of us will have. And so it's great to know about it and talk about it because there's nothing to be ashamed of about it. But trying to pretend like you're not having it when you're having mm -hmm. it is really damaging and hard. Mm -hmm. And then how do you think, I guess like going further than that, like just like, trauma-informed design can influence societal attitudes, but also how can like trauma-informed design be applied beyond the realm of technology, for example, in education and AI? Yeah, so trauma-informed, the concept of trauma-informed has been applied in many places, um, in, including schools, and that is great. So not only in perhaps how like programs are developed and how we treat you know children um, at different ages, but also uh, just thinking about how we're even setting up the power dynamics of a school, as well as how are we setting up the physical environment of a school. So architecture can also be trauma-informed, and there's a movement within architecture, which is pretty neat, uh, that seems to be just taking off, which is great. And then that's not only for schools, but also for places like maybe a recovery home where people are recovering from substance use, for example. We know now there's trauma-informed yoga, uh, there's trauma-informed law enforcement. Uh, there's trauma-informed in lots of these different areas uh, that people kind of figure out, like, what does it look like in this field? How do we have trauma-informed nurses? How do we have trauma-informed doctors? Because the whole idea of trauma-informed came out of the behavioral health field. And when I say behavioral health, I'm talking about mental health, but I'm also talking about substance use. Those two things are kind of grouped under behavioral health. And what we have learned from research is that when services in that field of behavioral health are trauma-informed, they're more likely to be utilized. There's like higher success rates of people sticking with it. Um, and so we have good reason to believe that if we take these trauma-informed approaches and apply them in other areas, people will benefit. People will get the help they need, get the support they need. Um, and that's really the ultimate goal, right, is to improve these outcomes. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think I'd be really interested to see how trauma informed designs can be applied into AI because I feel like that's the new thing and I feel like it's becoming so big like I feel like it's like research into trauma informed design and AI should definitely be like the next step. Yeah, I mean, it'll be really interesting because one thing that AI really falls down on is transparency. Mm -hmm. And transparency is really critical to being trauma informed. Um, it is really explaining like, where this information comes from. But right now in a lot of the AI systems, we don't even understand the data that's been trained. The, 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 the chat bot or whatever it happens to be is trained on. We don't have that information. It's not provided to us. And that's that's a big problem right there. So like, hmm, if AI is gonna be trauma informed, it has a lot of work to do. These companies have a lot of work to do to explain like what is going into these systems to make them the way they are. And, and what are they doing with the data that we're then giving all the time to it nowadays? I mean, I don't know about you, but I try to use AI pretty regularly. So I'm getting to know it more and more and using it for my daily tasks. And it'd be nice to understand more if that's being tracked and what the, where that data is going and how it's being used. And those are all things that are really important to be trauma informed. Mm -hmm. And then going back to what you said about like AI and like the challenge, like not like the challenges surrounding incorporating trauma design into AI, what have been some of the most challenging aspects of integrating trauma informed practices into your own professional work? And how have you like kind of addressed those challenges? Yeah, so mostly right now, people just aren't aware of it. Um, people are not trauma aware, which is really the first step of becoming trauma informed. So it's a process being trauma informed is like cultural competency. It's something you learn over time and you start by just learning about it. What, what is this, you know, if it's a culture, what is this culture all about and what do they like to do? And trauma, it's like learning the basics about trauma and how it works. So it really starts with making people trauma aware and say, Hey, this, this is a new idea. And this is something we should consider because it has a lot of relevance for anybody we're designing for especially people who have been marginalized in the past 
by different systems and that sort of thing, because we know from research that there's just a higher incidence of trauma in, in those various communities, right? Nobody becomes trauma-informed overnight. It's a process. Um, and most people, when I talk to people in tech, they haven't thought about it. Um, and they're just like kind of being like, oh, okay, so this kind of sounds like inclusion, which is a big thing in tech. And this sounds like ethics. Yeah, it's an ethical approach. So that's been my resistance so far. It's just kind of helping people understand like, no, 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 trauma really is everywhere. And you want to pay attention to this. And then ultimately, I think what we'll be able to see over time is some outcomes change. We'll get to see things utilized that otherwise wouldn't have been utilized because that's what we've seen in other fields. Mm -hmm, of course. I know when I first started researching about trauma design and stuff, like I feel like the word itself was, at least for me, a little bit misleading because like I thought that trauma informed design principles meant like not, I mean, it. Can, I think it can be, but not putting like super triggering stuff online and stuff. So that's what I initially thought, but I feel like obviously there has to be more work and like spreading awareness as you met and i think it's really important especially if people are looking for resources they need those resources to kind of be like made and centered around them and like inclusivity as you were talking about yeah yeah just like avoiding avoiding images online that are harmful that's just like one that's just one little thing right and, and that makes sense though that might be one of the first things you think about but there's just all kinds of other different ways we can make things more trauma-informed one thing I think about a lot is a, is a um, online, the way we interact a lot of times with companies, different kinds of organizations is through a form. And a form can have great usability. It can be really well designed. So it's super easy to use on mobile, on desktop or laptop, but it still cannot be trauma-informed. It would be trauma-informed if it's doing things like explaining, why do we need this data? Is there, where's this data going? Who's behind all of this? Is there a way I can not do the form and talk to somebody instead if I need to? Or like, what do I do if I have trouble with the form? And then even for specific questions, it's why do you need to know this information? Um, because just because you want to know doesn't mean you have the right to know or should ask or that I should have to give up that information. So it's much more, um, it's like a leveling up from good design, I would say. And it helps foster trust with people so they can feel comfortable filling out the form and trusting that it's going to land in the hands of people they they at least know who, who it's where it's going to be. And then they can move forward and get like the services or the help they need or the product or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And then I guess, can you kind of like on the topic of raising awareness and stuff, I feel like raising awareness also comes with like sharing like good anecdotes, I guess. So can you share a moment in your career where like a trauma informed approach change the outcome of a project or helped it become better? Yeah, so there's a lot that's hard to talk about because outcomes are hard to measure. Um, and sometimes, for example, when in 2017, I was able to work with an organization that focused on um, supporting those who, who are going through domestic violence. So I got to work with them, but they didn't have any analytics on their website. So we had no before and after to be able to say, oh, well, since this change, you know, we did a lot of things that were important. Like we took it from gendered language that assumes that all people who experience this kind of violence are female, which is not true, um, and changed it to be inclusive of all genders, for example. We took down the text that was written at a postgraduate reading level, and we took it down to a level that was much more manageable, especially for people who might be going through trauma, having a trauma response, because we know that cognitive challenge is one of the, the symptoms um, one of the many, many symptoms of a traumatic experience. So that's one thing that's hard is that we are just getting going with this. And so we need more research on the outcomes to be able to, to kind of say kind of what we already know about the behavioral health field, which is, oh, we know that this helps people use this more. So it's been definitely more anecdotal in general. Um, I can tell you a good example uh, when I was doing research. So I was doing some research with people who were justice impacted. And so they'd been through... Um, the prison system. And I had written out my research script and I had used, taken it with colleagues and we were testing a prototype. And this was a uh, website that was for people to help them find mental health services. So it's kind of a sensitive area in general. And after the first day of research, I was like, oh my gosh, people are telling me way too much information. Um, I had somebody talk to me about a murder they had committed that that was why they went to prison. So another person kind of told me their life story from like age 13, all this information that like, they didn't need to retell their traumatic story to me. 
I didn't need to hear it either as a researcher. And so I called up my friend, Dr. Carol Scott, who I mentioned, and I said, my interviews are really going all over the place. And I, we're just, what is going on here? And so she worked with me with my script and she said, oh, look, you've got really open-ended questions here. Open-ended questions, especially with people who've been through trauma and you're in this sensitive area, this is a recipe for a disaster. <laughs> like you need to really think about how to change your script. And we changed the script that night. The next day I went back with much more closed ended questions and it went much more smoothly where we were actually focused on the information that, that really I needed to gather and that they could provide without going into a lot of the trauma. Cause retelling of your experience over and over again, that can be traumatic for people. We don't want people to have to do that. So that's an example where like the outcome of the second day was much better after we put a tra more trauma-informed approach on, on that. And that was something that, you know, I learned just a few years ago. So we're still learning how to make it better. Um, and over time, we'll be able to measure, I think, does it make a difference when you make an app trauma-informed? Is this social media company be more successful because they're trauma-informed? We'll have to see. We need people to get out there and try it. And then mm -hmm. we'll get the outcomes. Yeah. I think your story is a real life example of how trauma informed design really helps people like people in general and also the people researching it. And I would just like to know like any other like I would just like to know if you have any other projects that you are proud of like regarding trauma informed technology that you would like to share. Yeah, so a lot of them honestly I can't share about <laughs> because I'm either under a non disclosure agreement or um, it's a government project that I'm not allowed to, to share if it's not public yet, for example. Um, I was able to help a nonprofit. I can speak a little bit generally. I was able to help a nonprofit that focuses on people um, who, who abuse alcohol um, and who, who may have a problem with that and, and worked on making sure that their website was comprehensible and at a good reading level. And that felt really good. I've gotten to do research with people who've been through human trafficking and being able to do that in a trauma-informed way that, you know, centered kind of their needs and made sure that like they were kind of the experts to kind of talk about what they needed. Um, that felt really good to make something better for people who are in a terrible situation um, that hopefully can, can get them out of that situation. I was working on a forum not that long ago, trying to really reduce the number of questions asked and making sure that people did explain like why <laughs> these questions were being asked and just trying to make things easier for people. And a good question that I get often is like, well, how is this different than good design? And that is something that we are still trying to suss out. If you're following the basics of good design when you're designing for young people or certain groups or whatever, if you're following the basics of good design, the usability heuristics we know, the, the patterns we know are important for mobile because we need to be thinking about mobile almost all the time. Uh, you're already like headed the right direction. Uh, but then trauma informed is taking it up another level. Like, can I look at my, my product that I'm creating from a lens of safety? Can I take it and think about peer support? Can I think about collaboration mutuality and some of the power dynamics? And so it's taking it up a whole different level. So that's a little bit about what's kind of what I've been working on and continue to try to just apply trauma-informed principles in each of my projects that come up. Like how can we be more trauma-informed in our research? How can we be a little bit more trauma-informed on the output and just kind of gradually getting there, knowing that it's going to be imperfect, but it's worthwhile to try to be trauma-informed. Of course. And that's kind of, that was, that was, kind of all my questions for the interview. So thank you so much, Melissa, for coming on and speaking with me. And thank you to everyone at home watching. And I will see everyone next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.